All right, Johann Sebastian Bach was a famous composer lived during the Baroque period. Um, you see his birth date and um, the year till when he died there on the screen. Um, I call Johann Sebastian Bach the Johann family um, because in um, uh, JS, as they called him, or Sebastian, as they called him, um, everyone in his family, every man, pretty much was named Johann, like his, like his granddad was, his dad was. He had many brothers. Um, his, uh, like he named all of his kids Johann, all his boys. Um, they had different middle names, of course, but um, everyone's name was Johann, and uh, that was just kind of the, the way they did things back then. Um, so their, their middle name was, was kind of what they were known for. So yeah, there were lots of pe people in the family, um, and all of them were named Johann. Um, as we jump into where he was born, uh, he was born in 1685 in a, a little part of what is now known as Germany called Thuringia. You see it in green there on the screen. Um, his family was known for being excellent musicians. Ever since they moved to this area, um, about four or five generations before, um, if, if you lived in Thuringia, you knew about the Bach family, and they were uh, very popular for, for their musicianship. Um, unfortunately, however, when Bach was about 10, both his mother and his father uh, had passed away, and so he was actually sent off to boarding school. And at this boarding school was a, a place he actually lived with, with one of his brothers, um, and he was, uh, here was a place that he got a lot of musical training. He joined the boys choir, um, and did a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, I have a book that I'm reading from, uh, for a lot of these called Bach, Beethoven, and the Boys. Um, and I'm going to read a little excerpt of what his education looked like and, um, how music, um, how we learned music here at boarding school. One of the ways Bach learned about music was to copy the compositions of his predecessors. He did a lot of this while at school. Nowadays, we would call this plagiarism, but back then it must have been okay. Since photocopiers had not been invented yet, he had to do this by hand. Historian Cecil Gray says he absorbed all styles instead of being absorbed by them. Carl Geringer says something similar. Young Sebastian absorbed all instruction as readily as a sponge does water. And so it was here that Bach under started to learn a lot of musical styles that had come before him as he was copying music for others to play from or to purchase. Um, and his musical training was um, advanced a lot when he was young in school here. So Bach's brother uh, that he lived with was a good organist and Bach followed in his footsteps, had a lot of time practicing the organ. If you're doing your paper over Bach, I would recommend researching the organ, understanding what it's about, watching like a how it's made video. Um, I would also um, uh, encourage you to watch some music um, on the organ such as um, Bach's Little Fugue. We actually watched that in the um, music era um, pr presentation. Also, um, a, there's a Toccata and Fugue. Um, you could say, uh, search on YouTube for Bach, Dracula, Cantata, um, because the song that starts out like this, or something like that, that is one of Bach's and it's on the organ. Um, but it, to us, it's it's come it's been come to known as like the the Dracula theme or um, you know a Halloween kind of theme. So be sure to look up the organ and do some research with that. So Bach's first job after his school days was an organist at a church in Germany. Um, here he was in charge of playing music every week. He often would have to play uh, several pieces, and he would um, eventually be churning out music at the rate of two to three new songs per week because uh, he wanted to play something new each and every week for church. Um, he was also in charge of the boys' choir. Um, his choir boys, unfortunately, didn't behave themselves. They were pretty rowdy, um, and so he didn't have a great time. He didn't have good classroom management uh, like uh, a good teacher would. Um, and eventually, Bach asked for a four-week vacation. He wanted to go hear a great Danish organist named Dietrich Buxtehude, and he traveled over 200 miles to see him, um, and that was on foot um, because they he didn't really have a whole lot of money back then to get transportation, so he walked that far. Now, the two musicians did meet, um, and Bach was thrilled with Buxtehude's performance, and it was amazing, um, and Buxtehude must have heard about Bach because he actually offered Bach his job. However, there was a catch. Um, the catch was that Bach had to marry Buxtehude's sister. Now, Bach at this time was about 20, and Buxtude's sister was about 30. 
Uh, so that's a pretty big age gap, even um, especially back then when people didn't quite live as long. Um, and Bucks Tooth thought that was totally normal because that's how he had gotten the job. He married a relative of his predecessor. Um, but Bach said no. He had his eye actually on someone back home. Um, and so Bach, instead of sending four uh, weeks away, which he had gotten permission, he actually spent four months away when he got uh, back. And of course, they weren't happy. Um, not only did he take too much time, but when he was traveling to, Bucks to, to hear Bucks Tude, um, he heard a lot of other organ music as well. And he decided that he wanted to be a bit more fancy and a bit more um, he, like kind of extra. Uh, and his congregation did not want him to do that kind of stuff. And so he was criticizing them. Oh, you don't want to have any fun. You're limiting my genius, that kind of stuff. And so Bach eventually decided to leave this church job. Um, he did get married to that uh, girl he had his eye on back home. Um, and he had a few jobs, mostly as a church musician. And he spent 10 years at a place uh, called Weimar, which well, some of his famous music was composed while a church musician there. After that, Bach became, became a school teacher at Leipzig, and here he was to teach music, Latin, and grammar. And while he was here, he wrote um, a, a ton of music, over 300 pieces. Um, uh, I would encourage you to research all of his music and, and how he utilized that. Again, a lot of it was for the organ, and a lot of it was for church performances, so make sure that you kind of dig into that. Now, Bach eventually became old, as we all do, and his eyesight became poor. Um, he still tried to compose, and he was actually very effective um, at composing. However, he did have surgery on his eyes. Um, it was kind of a, um, a risky surgery, you know, uh, hadn't been done a whole lot and proved successful, and it, ultimately it didn't work. Um, however, his uh, eyesight was miraculously restored 10 days before he died. So he, he got his eyesight back. Um, and then this book, this guy jokes that he must have seen his doctor bills 10 days after his sight was restored because it worked. And so um, he actually suffered a stroke um, and died. This guy has uh, just a lot of funny anecdotes and that's that kind of things because um, it's music history as it ought to be taught. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of fun stuff in there. So um, Bach left behind quite a big legacy, especially as far as Baroque music got. Um, so Bach composed a lot of music very quickly. He's known for how fast he could churn out a masterpiece um, because every week he wrote a song or two or three for church. He became the master of something called the fugue. The fugue is essentially a fancy way to perform around. And so that little fugue that we watched in the music eras um, was an example of this. Um, a fugue is you'd have one melody come through and then halfway through that melody you'd have another one start and the two melodies remember broke music is um, every part of melody those two melodies would continue um, throughout the whole song and even three and four melodies he also wrote a collection of songs for the clavier or clavier however you say that word I don't really know um, essentially uh, the a, a clavier is another t name for a piano. So it was during Bach's time that they actually developed the technology to uh, to tune a piano so that it's tuned as it is today. Um, it it was always a little bit finicky before this because of the tuning. If you, it's like some keys you could play in, but some keys you couldn't because it wasn't tuned very well. And so Bach wrote the Well Tempered Clavier, and it's a collection of songs. Um, it's two books of 24 songs with two songs in every key. And because now the piano was in tune, you could actually play in every key and it worked out pretty well. And so it was the first time that a piano was tuned like it is today. Uh, and Bach wrote some songs for that. Very popular. This is something that if you're a piano student, um, you will play all of these songs at some point in your life. Uh, he had 20 children. That's a lot. And some of them became composers themselves. Um, there's a composer named Car Carl Philip Emanuel. He's probably one of the most famous um, who uh, we have some music from his. Um, and he's also, Bach is known for just the massive amount of music as I've already mentioned, thousands of pieces. However, less than 12 pieces were published in his lifetime. Often while people were alive, and if you go watch the Mozart video as well, um, a, a lot of people didn't make a whole lot of money from the sale of their music. Like that just wasn't a thing until you know 17 1800s when when people wanted to purchase some of these um, older pieces of music and so like uh, the, these pieces weren't published it was after his life that a lot of people wanted to 
um, to, to get his songs and play them. So we'll stop there. That review is not for you. So um, that is what I've got about Bach. Um, please let me know if you have further questions or uh, things you'd like to know in your research.